This is session 13 of our Reimagining Careers Education series. So welcome back to all of those people who've been with us since the beginning um, and those lots of new faces today as well. Um, it's, it's, it's no longer a weekly chat, but fortnightly, um, most of the time, chat about student futures in our rapidly changing world, prompted by the pandemic. And we're very aware that we need a new visual very soon because we're not looking at how we do things for 2020. Everyone is neck deep in planning for 2021. And I think that's part of those conversations is why today's session is so relevant to everybody, because uh, I think we've, we've found and our guests today will talk about a real big opportunity for our 2021 planning in K-12 delivery of careers. Um, so hopefully we'll have some great insights and discussion. Get your chat on, please feel free to interact. Um, sometimes when it's a bigger group, everyone's a bit quiet, but, um, but please don't be, don't be shy. It's an informal fireside. There's not a big deck to present. So as you go through, please, as always, um, we want to spread this word and get more of this, more people involved in this whole community. Um, follow us on Twitter at Become Education, and uh, and we can keep this movement going and start planning. What what does this tribe become for for twenty twenty one, and what can we do in twenty twenty one as we get some momentum around this? Um, without further ado, this is a huge. Um, a huge session and a huge topic, so I don't want to do too much of a preamble. Um, we're talking about the intersection of well-being and career development, um, and we've recently, I've recently read this book by Dave and Michael, who I'm delighted are joining us today. Um, give us a wave, Dave and Michael. And as always, we've got Jim Bright as well. Hello. Um, so. I'm going to stop talking about anything there. I'm going to share the link to where you can get this book in the chat in a second. But without talking any more about it, if I can stop sharing my screen. Um, oh, my controls were hidden. Um, Dave and Michael, can you give us a quick introduction to your roles at the moment and, um, and what you're up to in life, where you are in the world, what time of day it is, and say hi to everyone. <laughs> Well, I can start. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Dave Redekop, and uh, I own a small but vital uh, career development consulting firm in the western part of Canada near the Rocky Mountains in Edmonton, Alberta. And we are one of the most northerly big cities in Edmonton, and uh, so a population of around a million, um, but kind of in the middle of nowhere. And it's uh, 16 below right now or 17 below. It's cold, it's snowy, it's no fun. And uh, I wish I was actually anywhere that any of you are right now. I, it's, um, it's just cold and it will be till, well, till pretty much March, uh, April. And um, um, yeah, my firm, we do anything and everything in career development pretty much except one-to-one -one career counseling and the reason uh, we don't do that as we all work out of our homes and, and we've been doing this sort of thing. Well, I've been in career development since 1988 and um, our, our business has been going full on since 1994, doing research, product development, practitioner training, uh, anything you can think of. And, and uh, there have been very, very few bad days at work. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mike. Thanks, Dave. Hi, everyone. My name is Mike Houston. I, uh, I'm 200 miles, 300 kilometers south of Dave in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. And it is, I think it's 13 below Celsius outside. It's snowy grounds covered in snow. And, uh, and, but it's awesome to be here, even though it's 1030 in the evening. But I'm so, uh, so excited to be doing this as a, as a, as a radio show feel to it, Liv, and I'm appreciating that. Um, I'm a, I'm, I think I'm a consultant for Dave's company since 1995, 1996. And my role with, uh, with life role has always been around practitioner tra training, career development practitioners. And when I'm not doing that, I work in a post-secondary institution. I work at, uh, at Mount Royal university in the counseling center there. And I do career counseling and, uh, personal counseling. And, uh, so kind of, so, and, and, uh, and run career workshops for post-secondary students. So Fantastic. it's good to, good to be here. Yeah. Well, we're not going to give you the uh, the weather from here, but <laughs> hmm. 
Thank you. Least, That's very kind. At least you get to light the fire and get cozy. <laughs> um, so start at the beginning. What what actually prompted your focus to shift towards this uh, this intersection, this overlap between careers and well-being? Um, well, Mike can elaborate with more uh, on the ground details, but you know, sheer fear. Actually, uh, <laughs> I've always been interested in mental health. My master's thesis was actually on on the nature of psychological health. So it's not that that's new. It's just. Um, what started happening was we, we, we could see policymakers uh, under the, the, the weight of the mental health movement and, and all this pressure to do something about mental health, whether in schools or in universities or in workplaces, looking for money um, so they could pay for these, these services. And um, they started talking about getting rid of career development services and putting them into mental health. And anybody in career development uh, knows that that's a mistake. What wasn't entirely clear when this conversation started was exactly how it was a mistake and why it was a mistake. We all know we do something that's useful in, in mental health and well-being, but we we weren't in a great position to articulate it then. So, um, yeah, plain old fear. Mike? Yeah, I would say it's exactly that. Um... Well, and, and frustration. I, I had been uh, one of my functions in the university was to was to uh, carry carry these career workshops for students, and uh, and I know this has happened in Australia as well. Uh, we uh, there's a, in Canada there's been a national uh, mental health movement in post secondaries for the for the past ten years, and in uh, in uh, secondary schools as well in the education system, and we were faced with uh, with. Uh, uh, I think a, a university administration that really wanted to be seen, they wanted to be seen to be doing the right things and they were looking to do something sort of obvious towards mental health. And so the, one of the thoughts at the time was to mobilize uh, resources as quickly as we can and including uh, displacing career resources so that we could attend to these mental health concerns. And like Dave said, we didn't have evidence at the time, but we were certain it was misguided. We just having uh, just doing this work, and and uh, like you all here, if you're doing this work, you you know that what you do makes a difference to the well-being of the students that you're working with. Yeah, I love that. Um, that re right in the introduction of the book about that intuitively, we know that I think it was someone that was languishing suddenly is really active in their life, knows who they are. Mm -hmm. Has, is, has hope about their ability to handle the future. And like all of those outcomes, we absolutely intuitively know we're having, mm -hmm. but it could be exactly the same for a, a welfare, yes, an emotional, um, another counselor. Um, so I think intuitively it's there, but you're right. I think when we're talking about 2021 planning, I think a lot of the challenge that we have is that people, including exec teams in schools are saying, yes, absolutely, we get this, there's this, this angle of like, how do we prepare students for the future? And then a competing angle about, oh my God, the, the state of people's mental health and outlook towards the future is, it needs to be addressed first. And it, it, it's been a kind of either or a fight, just like you say, mm -hmm. at the time level, as well as that policymaker budget resources at every level they're fighting. Whereas actually, yes, the people who are on the ground doing it know that they, they should lock together but it's the systems almost that are keeping them apart. So we're definitely having that conversation more and more um, with schools to say, you know, if you've got a space for well-being, so much of it is overlapping. Um, and I'd love to hear everyone's thoughts in the chat about whether that's a conversation that's happening at, at, in your environment and context. Um, so it, tell us a bit, you talked about the lack of evidence. Um, was there none when you started to look at this? <laughs> You know, I wouldn't say there was none. Um, it was just very scattered and a bit sparse, to, uh, for sure. Um, but again, par partially because, um, you know, if you talk to people who are in the business a long time, they go, well, duh, of course we contribute to mental health. Why would you study that? And, and, and they had a point, right? That even Donald Super, you know, in 1957 sort of makes this comment about, well, of course we do, right? Like it, it's just an offhand one sentence in, in this huge book. Um, and so, um, so that, that was what we wanted to do was start just gathering the evidence. And, and that's where um, we, 
we were asked to write a paper actually for the British Journal of Guidance and Counseling, thank goodness, by Franz, the late Franz Myers. And he, um, he had heard us musing about career development and mental health. And, and he knew, a, a, I think a paper would give us or force us to go actually dig up evidence. And what's interesting is there's tons of evidence out there that work is good for mental health, work is good for physical health. It, it's quite remarkable. And, and how many uh, ways it's been studied is remarkable. But that next leap to um, career development, the, the process of, of making transitions, making decisions, uh, uh, navigating various life roles, all those sorts of things, um, that is where we had to go kind of pull from various areas and, and start looking at, hang on, uh, there, there's no very few direct studies between a career development intervention and mental health, but there's lots of studies about a career development intervention and what it gets, and then that outcome and mental health. And that, that's what we started digging up. Um, to, to ultimately put the book together. And some of it is, and, and we're, we're, you know, a full disclosure here, some of it is, you know, hand-waving arguments that, that we're, we're pretty convinced of some of the things in the book, but a lot of research still needs to be done. And, and um, people might find very different ways of organizing ideas than we have. But somebody, um, you know, our, our aim was to really um, get the ball rolling in terms of career development writ large. Um, some of you may know a fellow named Peter Robert, uh, Robertson at, uh, in Edinburgh, and he'd been writing about career guidance, career counseling and mental health and well-being, and, um, and, and almost more on a, a social sense, uh, big picture sense. Um, but it was still focused on a very specific function of career development, not career development writ large. And we, we wanted to, to make it bigger and, and we see quite crude them quite broadly as well. So, yeah, I think um, your uh, the quote of the uh, quote of the session will be well, duh. <laughs> yes, of course it's obvious. <laughs> Sorry. Just in the, there's a really important part of the book and the, the webinars that you've been doing around that early clarification of mental health. Um, and I think I've seen I've seen a conversation as, as recently as today on Twitter from educators talking about the mental health crisis. <laughs> Sorry, it's suddenly very noisy here. Um, do you want to clarify around that um, that model that you use to, to explain that? Certainly, and in fact, Mike, how about you start? And Liv, can I share my screen and just show a diagram? That, that would Hold be on, let me, let me promote you. Yeah, but Mike, you can start chatting while Maybe. I hit all the wrong buttons. Yeah. Yeah, well, I was gonna say, um, just to the, the question of the evidence that uh, I think when we started out, there was, no, there was no direct evidence that said career development interventions were, uh, were pushing towards mental health outcomes. And so a lot of what we did, I was, I'm going to, I'm, I'm just going to talk about what you're about to talk about, Dave, but a lot of what we did pointed to career development as a conduit to other mental health outcomes, which is what Peter Robertson did in, in his work. He really focused on socioeconomic factors as a pathway for, for, uh, for between uh, career development and mental health. And we were able to find some correlates of uh, career development, uh, that really, that really definitionally fit with what we understand to be mental health. And with that, Dave, it actually fits nicely with what you're about to talk about. Wow. And, and hopefully on the screen now, you can see a, a model that was developed by a sociologist slash psychologist, Corey Keyes, back in the mid nineties, um, who at the time, it, you know, this was, he was working with Martin Seligman and some others, Chikchent Mahai, around this whole positive psychology movement. And somehow I, I suspect they all had a spat because you never see them published together. Um, and, um, but that would be none of my business. Um, but it, but what, what we have here is a model that, that pulls apart mental illness and, and mental health. And rather than seeing them on a single continuum where you're either ill or you're healthy, uh, what, what Keyes proposed was, well, maybe they're distinct, but, but um, or, uh, related, but distinct. And so Keyes' idea was maybe you can be mentally healthy or not, and 
mentally ill or not. Because um, if you look around at all the definitions of mental health that are out there in the world, and there are many, um, almost all of them say mental health is more than the absence of mental illness. But then that's about as far as it goes, right? Like all the definitions argue that mental health is something bigger, different, or better. Um, but this is the this is the cleanest model for for being able to talk about them in ways that, and, and I'm going to bring it back to the just practicalities here, in ways that career development practitioners um, can can work with and and. Um, help them deal with things that otherwise they would be afraid to deal with. Uh, practitioners in this country are, are, are very um, conscious of the ethics of going past their boundaries. And they've been told in no uncertain terms by many training programs that you, you shouldn't dabble in mental illness because um, you're not trained for it. And, and, and that's true if you're trying to treat mental illness. And so they're trained how to, you know, if somebody, a client has a mental illness, how do you help them overcome barriers and obstacles and get the help they need? But what this model does is it helps them actually look at, at their work and say, yeah, okay, so I won't mess with mental illness directly, but I can mess with mental health. I can make a, a, a positive uh, contribution with a client to their mental health. And so by working on the, that verti vertical line, what what the practitioner can do and do within their boundaries of competence is really help that client move towards flourishing and then count on the flourishing to help that client mitigate the severity, the onset, the frequency of their mental illness symptoms if they have a mental illness. And hopefully, um, and, and there's some evidence for this, of course, that, that you know, strong mental health actually uh, can prevent mental illness from ever being triggered um, and and um, um, and career development practitioners can deal with that head on which is really helpful um just to um there's a few things that have come come to mind i was just looking flicking through um to find the references in your book and i noticed they come under tangled terms as well um there is there is some evidence out there um in evaluations of career counseling um effectiveness um showing increases in self-efficacy mm -hmm. and one might plausibly think there's a link between self-efficacy and positive mental health outcomes so th there is a bit of evidence floating around there and in fact i was thinking back to some a, a thing that we did years ago now one of the early demonstrations of the of the impact of the chaos work that i do um and, and there was a, a university career counselor uh, an ex-student of mine, Real Davy, showed students at UNSW, University of New South Wales, videos of students talking about chaos in their lives and uncertainty and how they dealt with it, graduate students. Uh, and some of the outcome measures of that were increased self-efficacy, but also, and I, don't, I can't remember whether we reported this or not, it's not in the book, but it may have been in the paper. Um, we used a, an Australian measure, which is very widespread in this country, called the Depression Anxiety Stress Scale by mm -hmm. Peter Loverbond and Sid Loverbond. Um, and we, we found significant decreases in levels of reported depression, anxiety, and stress using that measure uh, as a result of, them, of that, that exposure. Now, we may not have published that. I can't remember. Um, but we certainly, we certainly played around. That's not much help to you if it's not published, of course, which is a bit I regret. Um, but the, the, we found increases in self-efficacy and decreases in some of those things. So there was some... We did play with that, but unfortunately, we didn't go further down that that path um, at the time. Um, so I think self-efficacy is one way of looking at it. I suppose there's another aspect to this as well, and you've acknowledged this in relation to there's a vast, as you say, amount of research on uh, work and mental health, uh, and that historically started with work on things like unemployment or workplace accidents and, and so forth and has, has broadened out. Um, clearly... And you also talk about the the issue of um, going beyond your competence uh, and, and and getting involved in treatment and so forth. And as a psychologist, I'm obviously been has been drilled into me over the years. Um, but there is certainly a pathway and, and and a rationale for some people, at least, to suggest that in fact, and you hear people like Mark Savikas talking about this, or before him, Anne Rowe would say something similar, even Freud, um, that 
work can be therapy. And of course, Mark would say, if you identify your preoccupation, then you turn it into occupation. So in one sense, one very effective way in which we, we can have an impact as career counsellors is to help people into meaningful work, as, or as Norm would say, work that, Norm Amundsen, that is, work that you know, has meaning and matters. Yeah. Um, and I think th that's, that's an indirect path to that. And it's a very, it's a very, very powerful uh, one. Um, the other thing I wanted to throw up just as a, as a comment, as an observation, as a prov provocation, if, if you like, is, um, is the notion that um, what might be termed or, or, or labelled possibly in, in DSM-5 uh, as a mental illness might for some people be um, it, the thing that, that gives them their success. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of the kind of the, the neurotic writer, academic, mm -hmm. musician, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Uh, athlete, um, the, the, those with the obsessive compulsive disorder or possibly a spectrum disorder whose who's special neurocognitive um, abilities uh, uh, provide them with exceptional focus or persistence uh, so they can achieve way beyond or, or even sometimes, you know, the, the, the sort of depressive characters who've produced beautiful works of, of poetry or... or, or or so forth. It does beg the question that if we ever did get to a stage of um, bringing everyone to what um, the psychiatrists would call normality, would we live in a very bland world? Yes, absolutely. You know, it's so interesting because, uh, you know, the, the DSM-5 and, and all these diagnostics, what, what ends up happening in the research is you have a couple of hundred, 300 mental illnesses to look at. Um, but, but when it comes to mental health, people talk about uh, one unified thing. There's mental health, there's well-being. And so it, it's um, w when we dug into the research, what, what we found were these very kind of global discussions about mental health. And then, but when looking at mental illnesses, by, researchers had to look at specific ones, right? So depression, anxiety, OCD, whatever. Hmm. And of course they, 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 they kind of never um, add up in the same way because they're all different if you lump them all together because they have, some of them are just fantastic hmm. for some roles hmm. and some are just disastrous for some roles. Hmm. And one of the things we found that uh, I found really interesting uh, as somebody who used, you know, is trained in psychology, but does, has been doing career development for 30 years, I kind of thought there'd be some global definition of mental health that psychologists and medical people agree to, but no, 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 no. Um, that there's, there are dozens and there's probably over a dozen really kind of dominant ones, right? Like a uh, World Health Organization versus Martin Seligman versus a uh, sociologist like, like Corey Keyes. And, and they're all slightly different. Mm. Um, and, and this, this creates all sorts of issues for, the research we would want to do because, you know, imagine being a career development person and doing research around mental health and then offending somebody in the mental health world because you didn't include their definition, right? It gets kind of ugly. Sure. Um, and so these are things we have to think about and, and, and not, um, I mean, I, I talk about things lately because I find lots of things kind of curious, but um, they're really important. Like it's amazing how research can get derailed if somebody is put out by it, right? Or, or somebody's definition isn't included. And so we've been uh, really quite careful about trying to find out what are the top factors that, that people seem to agree to. And, and there are a handful of them. Um, Self-efficacy isn't one of them directly, but indirectly it is because um, what's called um, environmental mastery or coping, right? That's one of the, the things that almost all the definitions of mental health can agree on that somehow people know how to actually get through life mm. and, and, and know that they know that's the self-efficacy part. Um, but yeah, I just found that fascinating that, that um, the definitions are quite varied and um, you can, you can um, measure a whole lot of things and somebody will agree with you that it's a mental health measure. Yeah. I, it's interesting. I, in a, in a kind of almost former existence now, it seems so long ago, I, I read a, a book with Fiona Jones called Stress, Myth, Theory, and Research, um, and did a lot of research research. And that, that term itself, we, we tore apart. And it's interesting that that scale, I was talking about the depression and anxiety stress scale. I was um, 
had a conversation with one of the originators and they 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 felt they developed it partly because a lot of these a lot of measures of ill health that were being used in the research at least and also in, but by gps and people like that conflated anxiety and depression into one generalized thing and their point of view was that actually the the, the interventions and the approaches are very different depending on what it is that you're dealing with it's, it's not a sort of okay yes you've just got men you've got you know you're mentally ill and we'll do the, the one thing for you um and the and the third thing stress was basically what was left over from the factor analysis it was the questions that were left over about a sort of generalized dysphoria as opposed to a clearly defined kind of concept it's funny because all of us intuitively use the term stress i'm feeling stressed um i remember my my father was a judge and he had black's legal dictionary on his study and it had an occupational stress a definition that to which executives are particularly prone <laughs> and this is what the legal uh, fraternity in the united kingdom were using um in court cases yet it was a hopelessly vague a hopelessly vague sort of uh, notion. And as you point out with the models you talk about in your book, um, there, there are some really quite different approaches to dealing with those, mm -hmm. those things. So I think you're right. It's a definitional minefield and you can get derailed very easily because there are some powerful forces out there with very vested interests. Yeah, I think I was, sorry, I, leave that. I was just going to say, I think we sidestep the, uh, the uh, mental illness or, or a discussion about mental illness in the book. Just by saying we were we are aware that there's lots of different ways of thinking about it, mm. and that and that that you could argue that there's there's different uh, that it's embedded in cultures differently, and there's uh, and uh, and then there's uh, so, some some debate, and we didn't we didn't get into it in the book, but some debate about uh, about whether or not it exists, right, or is it purely mm. a, a social cultural. Mm. phenomena definition, yeah. right? And and I could it's another I think it's another meeting, Jim, but. I think about anxiety and I think about how we used to work with it. Uh, so I've been in the, in the post-secondary system for 25 years and how we started intervening with it. And now how now what really works is, is exactly what you're saying is teaching people to work with it. We don't try to eradicate it. We're really, really trying to support uh, uh, students to understand it as an aspect of their sensitivity and, uh, and to work with it. So yeah, it's become, become very interesting. And it, uh, there is that argument too, isn't there? That this sort of the whole, the whole of that kind of um, self-esteem um, parenting program that that sort of started in the seventies and then really sort of hit its zenith probably in the in the nineties um, or early two thousands has has in fact had the exact opposite effect and increased levels of anxiety and, and sensitivity because yeah. people are just getting nothing but positive self-regard or positive regard. Um, and they're not getting they're not getting appropriate feedback, and they're not learning strategies and coping strategies and resilience. So um, they, it, move the conversation on because we could get um, we could get stuck into the mental health and unpicking that for the for the rest of the session. I think I think the point that you've all they're all talking about is that the it's undefined and very undefined. And I think particularly when we get to the practical level within schools, you know, we have schools talking you know positive psychology schools. We have. Um, a growing social emotional learning um, community. And I think for, I'm just gonna leave a podcast there from the learning future and I'm gonna put another one in around um, the different things that are happening in this space um, and where we could look to see an emerging kind of definition for from the OECD potentially um, around social emotional learning space. And I know in Canada that's kind of growing and I think here in Australia it certainly is as well. Um, but putting aside that and saying, okay, we're going to park the actual definitions and work with what we, we know about, so we know the broad buckets, what, um, how aligned, where are the overlaps between what we're doing if we're talking about careers education and the skills and outcomes we want and what we know are the broad buckets of, um, of, so, of well-being and mental health? Well, um, I'll go first, Mike, because I'm just more opinionated. Um, but um, I, I think if we if we think about this, uh, and again, this is a definitional issue, but but I won't dwell on it. But think about well-being as 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 the the you know very big, right? And and in Australia, you have this well-being framework that includes economics and housing and and. Uh, 
you know, quality of life and all that. Like it's a, it's a very big macro thing and, and society creates well-being. And what, what we've been looking at is more that individual, the mental health part of, part of well-being. But, but what, what's interesting about that is it does tie together, right? So as we help uh, students um, acquire the skills that Jim was just talking about, like actually acquire skills, not just be told they're okay, but acquires skills to hand handle adversity and to deal with with um, the um, uh, you know problems and concerns and stress and, and stressors and and those sorts of things. Um, all of that is is career education, um, whether we call it social emotional learning or not. I mean, we've done that with adults in Canada for years, right? You you have you know these adults who can't get employed. And you start working with them, and you find out, oh man, they have anger management issues. They 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 uh, they just can't regulate emotionally, and and nobody's ever helped them, right? So we work on that. We you know we used to work in prisons with this, and uh, um, and thank goodness now it's it's moved down to schools. We don't wait for complete abject failure to start teaching these sorts of things. Um, but to me, I mean, that's still all part of career development, right? We're, we're, we're helping people with the skills that they need to manage, navigate, make transitions, choose their roles, make decisions, et cetera. And, and when I look at the, the, the list of what's being taught in social emotional learning, to me, that's a, you know, kind of core career development stuff that uh, we used to just assume everybody had. Right, and, and maybe they were getting it at, at, at church or at home or at the mosque or at the synagogue. Uh, but now it's all up to you guys, right? It's all up to schools. Everything's kind of being dumped uh, that way. Um, and, and now the expectation is that schools should do something about it. And I realize this is a lot of work, but you know, it's actually better to have it centralized, but people are trained in something, I, I believe, right? That you folks actually know what you're doing. Whereas my parents did the best they could, <laughs> but, but it wasn't necessarily... Uh, uh, particularly well-educated best they could. Um, and anyway, so I, I digress a bit, but to me, um, it depends how you look at career development. But if we look at career development as, as the, the, the notion of managing li one's life's roles and transitions and moving in a direction one wants to move um, in a world that's pretty unpredictable, um, then all of education serves career development and, and the better we can do that broad-based education, and, and by broad-based, I mean the whole child, not just you know, the, the big curriculum areas, but the global competencies that you folks are actually pretty good at, I understand, and social emotional learning, um, all those things tie together. And to me, if, if school's going really well, um, uh, you could get away without a career education curriculum, right, because every teacher every teacher would be infusing career development into every subject, every conversation, right? Uh, about what does this mean for you? How is this important to you? What are you gonna do with this knowledge, right? But of course, we're a long way from that and it's very difficult. And so we do need some, some curriculum along the way to make sure that somebody's paying attention. Um, I, I, yeah, I like it, as you probably know, as a broken record, I wanna, I wanna jump in and say, and I think one of the things that we've, we have done uh, we need to do better, uh, and I think we've been part of the problem, is that we've adopted models which encourage people to believe that the future is predictable and controllable and essentially manageable. Mm -hmm. And this sets up people for being very brittle and this, <laughs> this obsession with having a plan and, and, then, then, and then this sort of complacent notion of a plan B um, well, I think current events have, have shown quite clearly um, how those plans can go out of the window very, very rapidly. Um, I, I was looking up a quote, just thinking before we came um, on air, as it were, and it's, it's one from a, a researcher called Master Pasqua from 1997, and he was talking about the need for disequilibrium in psychological health. Uh, and he said, um, quote, Chaos is not so much pathological as a state of maximum readiness for an emerging, reorganized self-system. Individuals most capable of uh, adaptation and growth are those poised at the edge of chaos. Now, you know why I'd like that, but it's. <laughs> um, but I think it captures something really important that we haven't, as a collectively, organizationally, 
um, as a, as a, a, a bunch of uh, colleagues, have, we haven't really emphasized enough and we haven't, we're not, I still don't think we are adequately teaching our clients, be they students or adults, about this notion of embracing uncertainty. It's almost a cliche, embrace uncertainty, but we never unpack it and we never to break it down into practical steps that people can take. And I'm a great believer that if people can have controlled failures and can be exposed to setbacks and then be coached and supported and scaffolded through those to show that they've actually got the resources and the, and the problem solving abilities to overcome these things, then that leads to very, very good outcomes in terms of um, mental health. And that, that's kind of the proposition from the chaos stuff is walk towards the uncertainty. Don't, don't pretend it's not there. Um, anyway, enough of me on the soapbox. Yeah, I, think I agree. That's... No, I agree with that. We've, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Liz, Liv, did I catch you out there? No, no, go for it. I was just going to say we've, yeah, we've referred, I think we're, we're in that box. So we've, we, uh, we've referred to it as normalizing uncertainty and and it's actually one of the things that when when career education addresses it and when it's done well we're actually doing that we're normalizing uncertainty and then the, the other thing is that uh, normalizing confusion as to that uh, these these periods where you are certain where you make a decision are preceded by periods of confusion for everyone for our, for the students that we work with but for adults as well that you that uh, periods of certainty are preceded and proceeded by periods of confusion. Um, but what you're, what you're referring to, um, like to have an idea about coping and an idea of what you're going to do with your uncertainty is uh, and one, of, one of the things I wanted to mention to, about Liv's question. She said, well, how, how connected are they, career development and well-being? And I just, I'm, I'm thinking of, uh, uh, we, we have a national uh, college, we, we, we use part of the National College Health uh, assessment in in uh, in our institution and it's used across Canada and in the states as well and I think probably Australia but I, but I'm not I don't know I apologize but um, but in that as one of the things they ask uh, is for these uh, these university students is in the past year um, how often have you been uh, significantly concerned or traumatically concerned uh, about a about a career, career concern how often has that been traumatic for you actually I forget the wording of the question but it was a large number, it was 30% of the, of the uh, sample uh, had experienced a concern about becoming, about a, a career decision in the past year that they thought was at the level of trauma. They, that was the wording uh, in the past year. So we, we know that career concerns are among the most worrisome uh, concerns that our students face. And that a lot of the adults that we work with for them is just just central to uh, moving forward in their lives. Mm. What you said, Jim, about about coping, if if you um, you might not have the answer, uh, but if you have a sense that you can cope with the concern, you allay uh, so much of the damage that uh, uh, and the stress that comes about as a as a result of not knowing what you're going to do or how to go about fixing it. Mm. Yeah, and I think I think what you're talking about those uh, metacognitive like that realization of what skills you have and how to fit it all together is the bit that's really hard to integrate into all the different subject areas so you know we'd really advocate for some explicit curriculum as well as well as that deep integration across all learning areas and all teachers connecting all those learning areas to the real world but I think it's it needs its own space to have those learning um, opportunities to talk about uncertainty to talk about you know how do we how do we explore and have that time and space um but I, yes absolutely if there was if it could be deeply integrated and across all areas i mean i think that's a big challenge for mm. general capabilities and and this work which is why i think when we're looking at these two areas they face really similar challenges in school and i'd love to hear from everyone um who's on the on the webinar right now what's what's in your context what does the, do these two areas face similar challenges in terms of resources, time, money, um, teaching? Um, what are what are the issues for you and opportunities for you? Um, and while while we're hearing from people, or ideally any other questions as well, while we're hearing from people, could are you happy to share those? You know the five five effects that you've pulled out of career development that that really talk to this and really overlap. Oh sure, yeah, I've got it. Because right. I think that makes it very, yeah. Right here. Um, yeah, I, I can quickly run through these. Um, 
It used to take me an hour, and now I can do it in about four minutes. <laughs> um, uh, but but we we know that career development um, produces effects, right? This is why we do career development. Um, and and what this framework does is tr just try and group them in terms of um, you know like meets like and 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 a little bit in terms of sequence. So you'll see we have career development processes in the middle, whether that's a career curriculum or whether that's a conversation down a hallway with a teacher, um, you know, career development things happen. And when those happen, um, a number of effects are produced. And, and the first set, um, you know, Jim's already referred to, right? There are life effects. People get work, they get an income, they get a title, they get a social, social identity, uh, they get pattern, they get routine, you know, once they're out of school and into work. Um, and these all have mental health benefits and, and there's really good evidence around all of those things. But here's where education is ridiculously important um, and speaks to career development rather than just career choice. Um, when education's done well, um, people learn things, they, they get abilities, right? They get competence, they get knowledge, they get skills. And um, what we know from all definitions of mental health almost, is that all of the, almost all of them refer to this idea of being able to manage life's ups and, ups and downs, to be able to cope with uh, the unexpected uncertainties, those sorts of things. Uh, some are more explicit about that than others. But the abilities um, that all educators teach all contribute to, to that ability to manage. The ones that career development people focus on, you know, the career management skills of decision making and exploration and 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 coping with uncertainty, um, uh, those are particularly useful for when you dig into the mental health definitions for promoting that ability to manage life's ups and downs. But you'll see in there too, and and maybe I can just pull up a list here. Um, if we look at abilities, the other thing that fits in there, um, which used to be called self management and life skills still is but you know a third of that is emotion, social emotional learning right it's about being able to get along with each other about being able to communicate about being able to be you know true to your own emotions and yet uh, contain them um, these are big things and and they're important to mental health directly but uh, maybe more importantly they get to what Jim's talking about self-efficacy that um, you, you can't feel um, reliably self-efficacious if, if you've never done anything and got stuff done. And, and you don't know that if you've never failed, right? So when, when students learn abilities, and, and again, I'm going to refer to the career education types, um, and, and they try them out and they actually get good at them, even though initially they may not be good at them, they start to feel uh, self-efficacy. And, and this is a way more potent variable than say self-esteem uh, or, or, or almost any of the, the self hyphen variables. Um, uh, by the way, a little trivia for you. The fellow Banjira who created self-efficacy uh, was, was born in a little town about 60, 70 kilometers from here uh, in the middle of nowhere, Alberta, um, Mundare, Alberta known for having the world's largest sausage. You should come visit. So we have self-efficacy. We have you know, that, that sense of identity, right? That what you help kids do in, in career education is get a sense of who they are, right? And, 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 and not in a rigid way, but, but a stable way, like a consolidated way, an integrated way. These are, these are important in terms of mental health. Uh, hope, you know, Michael was talking about coping and uh, if you look at coping as, um, uh, you know, the ability to uh, manage, manage issues, uh, hope is the idea of seeing that you can cope into the future. It's just long-term coping or, or what's called, um, Mike, what's the term? I'm just forgetting the term. Proactive. It's proactive coping. coping. Proactive coping. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's where hope comes from, right? Um, you know, meaning, purpose comes out of uh, the, the work you folks do. Um, um, and again, you know, Jim, just very quickly, I think the career field shot itself in the foot by, by pretending we could predict for about 70 years. Mm -hmm. and, and now we're all backtracking, right? And uh, um, 
you know, what we now know is there are many meanings and purposes that anybody can, can live out and it's not this one single thing, right? Uh, agency, locus of control. Anyway, so these things come about. Now, we have evidence for these three pretty, that's pretty decent. It's when we get to opportunity perception that of course, when you see yourself differently and you're learning exploration skills, et cetera, back up in the ability effects, you start to see the world differently. And all of you know this, right? Like, you know, you go and you shop around for a car and you spend all this time and, and you eventually buy the car you want and you drive it off the lot thinking you're the only one in Australia with this car and 30 of them pass you, <laughs> right? Like that's all you see all day long is the car you thought was so special. It's everywhere, right? And this is what happens when we're really working with kids and, and we help them see, get a strong sense of who they are so that they can actually look outwards, right? Like this to me is the huge part of social emotional learning from, a, from a, you know, the obvious career development point of view is, is it actually allows people to look up and out. And once they look up and out and they have some intention, they'll see stuff. You know, I don't know how Australia organizes occupation, but we have over 40,000 occupations in Canada. Kids don't know that. And so they see trucker and nurse and lawyer and doctor. But once they kind of have a sense of the, the general areas they're interested in, well, now they can go see that stuff and they'll see things that are actually connected to what, what, where their heart lies, right? So uh, we have less evidence that this, uh, or how this happens and, and that it happens and that it has the, the, the mental health benefits that we think it has. Um, but, but there's, there's tidbits. And then finally, we have almost no evidence for this last one, but there, there's population evidence, which is when people see themselves differently and they start seeing opportunities differently, the world starts seeing them differently. And, and you've all seen this with your, you know, your, your kids who finally get turned on by something right? Like a subject matter or a teacher thrills them or, or they find their tribe in a work experience thing. And all of a sudden, uh, they're different and everybody can see they're different. And because they're different, people start treating them differently and opportunities start becoming available. And you say, hey, kid, you want to come try this? You want to join this club? You want to do this, right? Or at work, it's, hey, do you want to come to a meeting with me? You're going you're gonna to meet somebody kind of interesting. We, we don't have evidence for that, but we all know what happens. And that then creates new life effects. So none of this is rocket science, right? This is just a taxonomy. It's a grouping exercise, but, but um, all of it, we, there, there's these lines to mental health that, that we need to solidify, I think, and, and uh, get more evidence on. And, and that's a challenge to all of us is, is we, we got to go find the evidence. So, if I'm looking forward, um, assuming that for, for, given we know there's constraints in school and K-12 around both of these areas, and everyone on this call would be advocating for more time for careers education. If we had this evidence, um, what, what could it look like in schools? And, and what can educators do, including their 2021 planning, to make it easier? Can we help build this evidence? I mean, we, we, we see a real power when we're, when we're doing our programs of sharing that back with the exec, like here are the impacts. So is it a case of broadening our outcomes to a more common language and explicitly saying, here's the well-being outcomes and the career development outcomes, and here's where they go together? Mike, I'm gonna have you talk about your little three hour workshop. <laughs> yeah. while, I, while I find a, a measure, because what I wanna okay. illustrate, and I, I think, I hope you agree with me, Mike, is that this does not have to be complicated. Right. I think, yeah. so I think it's, I think it's down at the end of this presentation, Dave, but, but I'll just uh, speak to the workshop every, uh, the last Friday of every month. It's been a bit different since I've been working from my basement, but uh, I run a three hour workshop and it's a, it's a pedestrian uh, career decision-making workshop where we talk about elements, the elements that go into things you might want to consider for effective career decision-making. We do actually talk about interests and values and strengths and, uh, and a good, we spend a good amount of time just thinking about life roles and how they interact and the meaning of it. And we provide a very broad definition of 
of career development. But I, uh, but I know where you're going with this, Dave, and I always like, uh, I always enjoy hearing you, you uh, talk about this. This is a measure that we, uh, that we just, we started to accumulate, and the context for it is, uh, it was actually started around the time that we were getting questions about whether or not we would retain our career function in the uh, in the counseling center, and 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 if not, just focus on mental health. And I just, uh, it came from the space of that's got to be crazy. We need to do something that demonstrates that there's mental health outcomes happening. So back to you, Dave. Okay. So on this, this is just, um, um, you know, what's called a post pre measure. So instead of doing a pre and a post, you wait till the intervention's done. And then you ask your, your clients or your students, how are you doing before? And how are you doing now? So you get your pre and post in one, one go. So, Mike hands this thing out. It's 10 simple things. And students rate each of these items from zero to four, where zero and one are unacceptable. Um, two, three, four are acceptable. Um, and, and notice, you know, these are understanding the role of interests and in making better career decisions, understanding the role of values and making better career decisions, right? This is, this is kind of stuff we all do a lot. Now, Here's the second highest difference score. So these are just the average scores, you know, 1.78, 1.83, 2.2. That's the average scores of students when they say, this is how I was doing on these items before this workshop. And here's the average score after the workshop. And notice, by the way, they're all over three. Like they're all acceptable in a strong way. But look at the difference scores here. The second highest difference score, 1.82, by the way, 1.9 is the highest difference score. Uh, understand how to research career options, number six. But the second highest one isn't talked about in the workshop. It's not discussed. It is a, a byproduct, an outcome, a natural uh, consequence of doing the other things. And so much of education is this way, right? That, and, and this gets back to my thing about curriculum, and, and I, I totally get it. We need a curriculum around career education. I think it's a good idea because it, it gets kids thinking about things uh, if it's done well. But I, I also uh, do have the firm belief that a, a great, great deal of education is already brilliant career development when done well. And if you do that brilliant career development, um, you, you also get some really good mental health outcomes. And so it's not like we all have to go do something different and become therapists. It's we have to pay attention to what we're doing, find out where the effects are, and then, and here's the, the PD, the professional development part of it, is then think, well, hang on, if this workshop's already producing mental health outcomes, and I don't mention anything about mental health, I, I wonder if we could dig into what does it, and maybe put a little more energy into those things so we can make that 1.82 a 1.9 in a year. Like not huge, huge changes. You folks don't have time for that. You're not researchers. Um, but the idea of gathering evidence and data and seeing what can you improve, what can't you improve, that's always useful. But then you do what Mike did and start sending it up to your administration. And all of a sudden they start asking for it, right? And now they want to know, hey, what kind of mental health outcomes are we getting? And again, like it's, it's not a big deal to add one item to something you're already doing, right? So uh, I, I think for me, when I think about the realities of it, it's just keep it really simple, keep it doable, and, and keep it in a place where you or whoever is doing the data collection, your, your career educators, um, where it can actually inform their practice. Because if it can, they'll keep measuring. And if it can't, it all falls apart, right? It, it just becomes another bureaucracy thing that nobody wants to do. Thanks, yeah, I think that's that's the key, isn't it? I mean, that's what we've talked about throughout this series is making that value visible to actually mm -hmm. gain more profile, more priority, more resources, all of that thing. And I think this is another angle on value which is often more important. I think you see from the Grace's comment there that at the moment, the, um, yeah, just they're very stressed. Young people are very stressed over everything, uh, over performance in tests and all sorts of anxiety, even not just about the future. And I think it's, and that's what I'm seeing is a real reactive, like, oh my God, how can we fix their 
the current anxiety and well-being as a really reactive kind of, oh, geez, this has been a really tough year. Whereas actually, if we can go back and say, actually, if we increase that future horizon and don't focus direct, we don't have to hit anxiety head on, we can hit it through this in a, in a more indirect way by focusing on the future, giving them agency over it, then we might have the same outcomes. Yeah. Um, I'll just go to, um, oh, sorry, Jim. I, very, just very briefly, I wanted to go back. I, I, I like Dave's comment about um, the, the notion that the world sees you differently when the person has got a sort of sense of who they are and what they, what, what they can offer. I, I would also add to that, and I think it's also a pathway for coaches and career counsellors, that sometimes it, it can be a bit like um, the, um, the kind of black swan notion of um, what you don't know, you know. And sometimes the world can know before you and the world can identify skills and talents within you that you don't yeah. really know or aren't consciously or fully confidently aware that you have. And I think there's a really powerful coaching and counseling story in that. And, I, and again, I was talking to you before about Elton John off, off air. And if you looked at his movie, Rocket Man, there's a, there's a pivotal moment where his grandmother has faith in him and sees him being able to play the piano and says, I'll take you along to the Royal Academy. You know, and so often you hear in these narratives of, of that key agent, that person who sees something in the individual, has faith in the individual, and and then and then you know, the, kind of the rest is history. So I, I really like that analysis. Thank you. Mm. I've just put the um, the links to the book before we. Some people have to run off dead on time. So just before we go, I've put the um, the link. There's a Seric link there, um, and the Amazon Australia link. Um, on the CEREC website, you can actually get a downloadable PDF um, for free, uh, kind of them. And, um, and CAAV were really involved in this process as well of supporting the book. Um, so a special, there's lots of tips to, to Australia in there. Um, I'm also going to send um, the registration for our next session, um, which is all around primary, um, the primary years and the importance of that. So please also, I know we don't have many primaries, um, people on here, and some K-12, but uh, please share it with your feeder schools as well, because primary principles is actually easier, easier for stage three and two to incorporate this work than high schools. Um, although, and we know that it can be really nice to inherit those children who have already been through that eye opening and, uh, and have that excitement about their future. I'm also just gonna launch a quick poll um, thinking about planning for next year around um, potential professional development and how, how interested everyone is in this, um, in this area and in Dave and Michael's work in particular. Um, so if you can see that. Mm -hmm. So the two questions, uh, would a framework that aligns the outcome of wellbeing and career development help you to overcome challenges in your context? A hundred percent yes at the moment. Um, <laughs> And would you be interested in more in deeper formal professional development? 100% yes. Okay, right. Well, we'll come back to you on some options for that then. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm, one person who's actually been through, one person's on the call and is a regular to these sessions that, Karen, if you're still there, I'd love for you to uh, unmute and um, share how you, what your learnings were and what your plans, how it's changed your plans um, since yep. um, the, the webinar series. Hi, um, hi Liv and, and Dave, Michael, James. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, so I originally did the training with Dave and Michael back when they came to Australia through the CAV and then I saw it pop up through CEREC. So I attended the webinars or I must um, admit I did do the first one, which was at 2.30 a.m. Australian time. Um, but then I kind of waited and, uh, for the recordings for the following one. So you would have seen me popping up for the, the online sort of questions and whatnot, but then it was just too hard for me to stay awake during the day, not very much a, a night type of person. But I guess one of the things I kind of look at when I look at the, I guess, the education that I've been able to get around this, I kind of think about the haves and the have-nots at school. So the students that have an idea often display those competencies and those things that you talk about. So those little circles that we saw in that diagram and the ones that are really struggling. So, and often at the worst, you know, they do have some form of mental illness or they become school refusers. They're missing those things. So when we're in a school, we can often identify that there's something going wrong and we try to help our students in different ways. But I think by looking at a framework and looking at models, it gives us the agency as career practitioners to be able to share that information with other people in our schools 
Um, and I've found in my role, I'm in mean, a student welfare action group, we have psychologists and, you know, heads of house and so forth. And we talk about students that need our assistance. And I make sure that when I'm talking about the students I'm working with, what I'm doing and how that is actually helping to improve their mental health. And listening to what you were saying today, um, Dave, when you're talking about those, um, the different circles, as you were talking about each one, I'm like, yep, I've done that. I can see how I've assisted that student. And when Jim was referring to how a student is seen differently, in the course, um, we had to do an activity where we had to actually identify in the table that you gave us what we were doing in our practice and how that aligned to the different things that you had identified. And I think the example I gave was around work experience. Um, in our school, we've had three students take their lives this year. And we've also obviously been faced with remote learning. So it's been a very tough year for us. And one of the boys was good friends with one of the boys that had taken his own life. His mental health suffered dramatically. His mum was becoming desperate. And we managed to get him out on work experience during the school holidays. And I went and visited him. And in the first instance, I guess, you know, he, he wasn't necessarily as positive as one would expect. But by the end of the week, he had a really good interaction with an employer and did a further work experience with that employer. And the change was amazing. And it wasn't just how I saw the change, but then his mum said to me, his mental health has improved. He, he's talking to his friends about what he's doing. And now his friends are interested in what he's doing. So the power that comes from experience and exposure and having that conversation and then providing that guidance back to our schools is so important and, and so strong and not more so than now. You know, we've got so many challenges facing our young people that we need something that we can say that we're a part of this, but we're not separate. So I think most of the audience in the school system would agree that often careers is kind of like, you know, the dike with the holes in the wall and you stick your finger in to stop the water from getting through but they don't often use us in combination with wellbeing. And that's what I'm trying to achieve. I'm trying to link that together. Um, and, uh, you know, we are also trying to organise some PD in Geelong next year with, um, with Dave and Michael to try and uh, help with our other careers practitioners as well to do this. So, sorry, I could ramble all day, but um, I have just found it really yeah. helpful, the structure, the reflection, and, you know, the recognition from my point of, geez, I, I am making a difference here, but I need to communicate it. How can I communicate it? It's giving me the agency to be able to do that. Right. Fantastic. Thanks, okay. Karen. Yeah, it's so powerful to hear those real stories and mm. be able to gather that evidence as much as the data and the numbers. I think, you know, we say it intuitively, we get it, but some of those stories are what will capture everyone else's minds and hearts and, um, and make them believe and prioritise it. Um, thank you so much for that, Karen, and jumping in. Um, Huge thanks to Dave and Michael for joining us today. Um, I think we've got a lot to talk about, as so I'm hoping you'll come back and see us in 2021 and, uh, and keep us updated. Um, thank you so much, Jim. Um, for anyone that um, wants to stick around for five minutes, we will normally have a little after party, if you're not familiar, of just uh, you have to have your video on and we talk about something completely different and have a catch up. Um, so thank you so much, everybody, and we'll see you next time.